Okay, welcome to the second episode of Critter Snap. So we are four biologists who just really like natu- uh, nature photography, and uh, we're going to talk about it. And uh, we wanted to present uh, what we're what we're actually doing. Uh, two of us, or two of us, use micro four thirds cameras. The other two use uh, SLR cameras or DSLR cameras uh, in our work and uh, in our hobby photography. And we want to go around the horn in the next few episodes and uh, present uh, the specialties of each of us. So, and uh, Cern uh, is going to start today. Uh, he specializes in insect macro photography and uh, has uh, lots of really cool shots of butterflies, I think, especially, and uh, dragonflies and so on. And he's maybe, uh, he's definitely better than me at finding those subjects out in the wild uh, <clears throat> in a stage when they're when they're actually easy to photograph because they're still cold. So I'm going to uh, hand it over to Cern for this. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Daniel. So as Daniel said, I usually take pictures of insects. And the way I usually do it is uh, in the early morning, so around sunrise, because then the animals are still frozen, basically. So they cannot ex- escape and you can get very very close to them. And of course you have the best light and the least wind. So a lot of advantages. And to what, demonstrate... What well, around sunrise, so depends on which latitude you live, but... Oh, okay, sorry, yeah. every time around sunrise, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so here in Germany in summer it <laughs> might be 5 a.m. Or, or earlier sometimes. So you need a good alarm clock. That would be the first piece of equipment that you <laughs> might need. Um, and the way I plan my tours is I check these weather websites, uh, especially for wind forecast, because well, wind is the the enemy, the natural enemy of of macro photographers, as you all know. Um, why is it, why is that? Can you well, go into that a little bit? Um, when you focus to such a small and close subject, each little piece of wind just pushes your your object out of the frame. And you don't have plenty of light in the early morning, so you need longer exposure times. Like I would I would even say that half a second is something standard for my type of photography. Wow. So you yeah, can imagine really cool. so you can imagine if, if there is wind it ruins your shot. Yeah. So why, why wouldn't you not just increase the speed and open your being wider in your opening? I don't know. How much well, how, how wide do you open your diaphragm? I usually have like f5.6 to f8. That's what I usually aim for. So very shallow. Yeah, I mean that's that's the thing you always fight for bigger depths of field, basically. Um, so the way I wanted to go through that is to just show one picture, which is kind of a basic macro shot that um, it's a side view of a dragonfly. And I just wanted to talk through how to achieve such a shot. Um, I hope you guys can see the dragonfly yeah. right looks, now. Looks good to me. Yep. Okay. So I can zoom in a bit. So it's pretty sharp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and this was at uh, a speed of half a second or something. Yeah, something like that. So what do we need for this? So first of all, as I said, um, I get out in the field very early in the morning. Um, so what time? Find... What time did you uh, do this shot? That was maybe six a.m. or so. Okay. Um, and well, you find dragonflies basically on every pond, so you don't need to find super extraordinary heritages. Depends on, of course, which species you want to find, but you can basically do it in your backyard if you are lucky enough to have a pond in your backyard. Or on the golf course. Or on the golf course or whatever. <laughs> like we did. Okay, so first of all, of course, you need a camera. In my case, it's the Olympus uh, OMD EM5, the first version. Um, 
the one big thing you want to have for a camera for macro photography is some kind of live view. Um, I will go to that later because I think that is a really big deal. Um, well, next, what do you mean by live view? Well, that you can preview the, the image on the screen, which yep. is for mirrorless cameras, of course, the standard, but not, not all DSRs have it. Well, all modern ones have it, but if you have like a Canon 400D, which is still around, <laughs> um, this, for example, has no live view. So well, then, of course, the image is going to be exposed like once you pull the trigger. Yeah, and well, the big thing for live view is that you can magnify um, pieces of your image. So you can just zoom onto the head where you want to put your focus on, and then like 14 times magnification, and then it's really easy to focus on that. Yeah, right. And and you could actually see the 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 exact exposure that you're going to get on the picture. So that's, right. that's a great advantage. Exactly. So I, I use the screen all the time to compose and focus my images. Um, yeah. Then, of course, you need macro lenses or one macro lens, or in my case, I have like three because I'm a bit a nerd. Um, but we first use of all, three? this would be um, the Olympus um, Ego uh, 60 millimeter macro. So this is the system specific lens four micro four thirds from Olympus. I have and that one as well, and I love F2. it. F2.8 and um, Two. Very, very small, very lightweight, um, and really, really sharp. Really nice lens. If that is too expensive for you, um, you can get very good results with uh, budget solutions, which is you gr grab an old macro lens from eBay, for example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So, and can you can you try holding that still a bit? The connection is a bit slow right now. So it's... Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the Minolta 50 millimeter macro f 3.5, and you can get it for uh, like 60 bucks, I would say. And okay. it's a really nice lens, really nice manual focus. And all you need to use it on your camera is an adapter which you can get for cheap also, like $15. OK. OK, so yeah, that is uh, your camera setup. And then for my type of photography, you really want to have a tripod. Um, right. If you don't know which tripod to choose, most important thing is that you can get quite low with it. So because most of the time your subjects are like the height of your knee or whatever, so you want to have a tripod that uh, can bring you down to the ground, basically. Some tripods have a big middle column that prevents you from spreading legs um, and, and go really deep. If you need to go deeper, I use a, like a beanbag. Okay. So for that's not a real beanbag. That is. It's not a real like beanbag. Bag. That is a commercial. I was say. Commercial yeah. Yeah. You, that's you a, that's a fancy beanbag. Yeah, that's wow. a fancy beanbag. You could um, just make one of those yourself pretty easily, I assume. Yes, you can. Would you favor a big tripod over a small tripod? Because I use only the small tripod, but and I always saw that you have a huge tripod. <laughs> Which is important. Yeah, I have a small camera and a huge tripod. That's um, right. <laughs> well, it has disadvantages and advantages, of course. It's 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 pretty heavy, but it's also really stable, so it does not shake. And like wind, camera vibration is also, of course, a big disaster if you expose your shots for half a second. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but anyway, if you have wind, that your subject is going to move, so... Yeah. If, so, you, like, for, if your tripod for, can move, I think you're not out. <laughs> <laughs> for that, I will showcase another piece of equipment. That is the so-called plamp. It's also... I think it's Wimberly is the, the, the brand. But of course, you can also build one yourself with some um, yeah, clamps. Yeah. 
I've done uh, a bunch of building with these style um, tentacles, like the uh, they usually modular hoses, like they're meant for industrial applications originally, yes. like for uh, yeah making hoses and uh, all kinds of nozzles to them. So you can actually buy these things in bulk, so the the individual pieces of those, and then right. you can just clamp them together at the the length you need them. Uh, yeah. So yeah, if you Google for modular hoses, uh, then then you'll find some of those. It might be cheaper than the stuff you get on uh, on a dedicated camera shop. Anyway. That's my a great solution. My alternative for that, I don't know if Seren, you have that. Is uh, this is really cheap? I don't know how much it costs, but probably fifteen bucks or twenty bucks. Can you hold it up higher? Yes. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, unfold it. Um, is this? I think it's called this. Third hand or something like this is yeah, for electricity. Yeah, they call soldering and uh, like yeah. I don't remember exactly stuff. how they call that. And so you have those uh, forceps here that you can actually use the same thing. It's actually, I mean, it's an alternative. Yeah. Also cheap okay. and and you can also carry it pretty easily because it completely folds. So, okay. So so Stan, what do you actually do with that clamp? Well, what I actually do is I use a knife. And attach that, and then I ram that into the ground. Okay. Like, and then with the other clamp, I fix the plant or whatever the insect is sitting on. Ah, okay. And that way, um, you reduce the shake from wind. Okay. And depending on where you live, and I live on the coast, um, I need that quite often because uh, we have maybe three days a year where there is actually no wind. Um, so this this helps a lot. So say. because you go elsewhere and you protect yourself from the wind or because you have the stem that is shorter? How, how do you um, save yourself from the wind with, with this? Yeah, well, if you have... If, if you photograph a butterfly and it is, it is sitting on the, on a leaf or on the, on the twig, right? And this is shaking. And then what I do is I try to attach the clamp as close to the subject as I want. Of course, not in the frame, but that way um, the, the wind can't All right. attack it so much. So that's, that's a really useful piece of equipment. Okay. I can definitely recommend that or a self-made solution. Yeah, you convinced me. I bought it. Yeah, me too. I mean, I bought mine you because bought of yours, it? right? Oh well, yeah, I bought it. I, it only took me one day to seeing it in the field, and that was enough for me. Okay, I thought you, I thought you bought it <laughs> just now when he was telling you about it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> one click buy. <laughs> I also, yeah. so I also like it not only for the wind, but for what you were doing by um, uh, choosing the good background. Because sometimes the insects are not on a perfect background, actually, I would say, most of the time. So if you actually cut the stem and you just bring at the, at the place where you want, it's actually nice. And that you have, can yeah. get very nice bouquet by doing so, right? Yeah, you can do that. And I mean, scissors are also part of my macro equipment, for example, to clean up the background from twigs or whatever is going into the frame. Um, so you can design your picture a bit better. Um, of, of okay. Course, so of course, if you do these kinds of things, you have to you have to really have a light touch and not start to really chop down vegetation just to make it course. suit your your needs. Oh, but if there's sure. like an errant, like blade of grass in the background or so, that's like the level we're we're talking yeah. about. I think it's like from what I've seen, yeah, you use this. I, I don't cut down flowering plants or whatever. It's just pieces of grass, basically. Um, right. So that is from the equipment side of uh, the metal. So then we get out to the field, and then the, the task is, of course, to find, uh, uh, find insects. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And that's actually pretty hard, because, as I told you, they don't move in the early morning, and our eye is not really trained to that. So finding them, it needs some practice. So what I usually do, I just walk uh, around the pond and really just screen every piece of leaf or whatever um, grass where I suspect animals to sit. And of course, knowing a bit of the biology helps in this regard. Right. I was going to say, like, is there 
<clears throat> a specific height that you search for this? Um, does it vary a lot? Um, well, um, for dragonflies, most important thing is to know when they hatch, basically. So when is their season? When when can I find a specific species of dragonfly I want to take a picture of? Because, of course, they are not around all year. Um, that is important. And then the time when dragonflies uh, do their, their enclosure, their, their last molt, basically. Um, which is usually in the morning till, I would say, 11 a.m. Then most of it is done, mm -hmm. from my experience. You may want to actually give us, uh, or give the, the, the listener, what the piece of biology here. So what is the different stages of dragonflies? Do they understand why you would do that? Well, um, let me showcase a picture. Um. So yeah, because they have different stages. One stage is in water, and they're going to emerge. Exactly. So yeah, and you have the pictures of all the all the stages, right? Yes. So this is what you can see here is a larvae that crawled out of the water on a piece of grass, and the adult dragonfly is emerging from that, and that's really fascinating to see um, and to take pictures of. But you have to be really careful because in this state, of course, the dragonfly is really fragile, um, so don't touch it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. How long does it take um, for them to, uh, to finish that process? Um, it's a it's about an hour I would say, and then they are sitting there for quite a while till they make their first flight. Sometimes they don't even make their first flight on on the day they close because it's too windy or too cold or whatever. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can next morning you can find adult dragonflies sitting next to their um, their old larval larval skin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. So let's get back to the picture I showed in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And of course, all this is true with damselflies. Yeah, of course. Uh, or butterflies. Um, and with butterflies, it helps a lot to know which are their favorite plants, where yeah. they lay their eggs on. That's yeah, that's, that's one nice way and, to find them. And Timing, like in following the seasons, is, is like really important, right? Because, like for example, I was amazed when Soren showed me all this, these different techniques and how to find these animals coming from the tropics where there aren't like seasons, like there are here in northern United States. There's no winter, there's no fall. Um, you, it's you, it's you, you barely see this. You're you would be very very lucky to see these uh, this sort right. of you know, metamorphosis happening, um, finding it. It's because it's it happens throughout the whole year. But so in places where there are seasons, um, when's the best time of the year to do this? Um, well, I usually have most success around the Easter time, so beginning of April or throughout April. Mm -hmm. So it's spring. From my experience, that's the the prime time of uh, hatching dragonflies, but there are also species that emerge in uh, a later stage of the year. Okay, like in autumn. Yeah. All right. So back to the picture. Once I found the dragonfly and set up my camera and stuff. What I really want to do is focus on the eye or the head of the animal because that's for me that is the most important thing that this is sharp. Yeah, yeah. that's so, usually I think for all kinds of photography whether you're shooting animals or yes. people that is where everyone's gaze is drawn to so you want to make sure that the eyes are in focus. Right. 
it looks looks really not good if the eyes are not sharp. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the whole rest of the animal sharp. can be sharp, but if the eyes aren't, then it doesn't look good. Exactly. But how do you determine that it's actually sharp? Because with insects. Yeah. Here comes the the live view into play. So I I really use the magnification on the screen, and then I manually focus. Auto focus will not do it in this case, because it's just the distances are too small and, and when you are that close. So I do all manual focus, focus on the head, and you can really nicely see the uh, the facet eyes of dragonflies, and you can really s nicely see when it is sharp. And once I have done that, I, I can zoom out again, and then I basically zoom at the abdomen of the dragonfly and check if this is sharp. Mm -hmm which mostly is not the case on the first try. Um, okay, so you so want to be I, exactly perpendicular to the uh, long axis of the animal. Right, at least for this picture. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, it can be also interesting to have a, like a, yeah. a little bit side frontal view, but if I take a side view, then I want the whole body to be sharp. If it's a real side view, yeah. because mm -hmm. if not, it just looks like a mistake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the way I do is I focus then on the tail until it is in focus, and by knowing in which direction I I turn the focus ring, I actually know if it is closer to the camera than the hat or further away. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that way. Um, that way I can know how I should um, move my tripod a little bit to, to adjust for that. You can also All just right. step, step by the side and check optically if your subject and your lens are more or less in parallel and not like that. Yeah. Because then you and, know uh, so, so in this case, like, so you get enough, uh, enough um, depth of field at uh, the, uh, what did you say, like 5.6 to f8 mm -hmm. or so, like that already gives you enough depth of field to get the whole animal uh, in focus from the side like that? That gives me enough depth of field if I am exactly perpendicular. Huh, yeah. But I, I sometimes need like 20 tries to yeah, achieve that. that. Really. So how, how, big, uh, how big is the animal? Like how big is that dragonfly? Uh, that dragonfly is a small one. It's like, yeah, maybe five centimeters. Okay, yeah, that's... Smaller, three, three centimeters. So it's pretty small. That explains it, yeah. With a bigger dragonfly, you would need, like, a um, much uh, smaller aperture, I would think. Well, to get that not job. necessarily, because for a bigger dragonfly, uh, you, were, you have more distance. So you are not at one to one, and then you have higher depths of field. So it's actually yeah. easier yeah. for bigger subjects. I would say that I would that say say that too because if you have to be closer in order this is if you want to have the complete frame mm -hmm. for the frame complete with your with your subject yeah. of course if you're on a crop it doesn't work but for the same distance but if you want to have the full animal on your on your on your picture without cropping then it's actually exactly the problem so smaller yeah, will that, be that's what I mean yeah and it will be it will be harder so yeah yeah. So I do this and I check by focusing in one direction I know how to move my tripod and then I really move the tripod just a tiny bit and check again. And that can take some time. Depends on how, how good of a day you have. Sometimes it's the first try and it works. Sometimes I really mess it up and it never works. <laughs> okay. Would you recommend a rack? A trail, sorry. Um, you mean a focus rail? The focus I bought one now from Novoflex. It's a really nice macro rail, but I have not I have not had the chance to, to use it yet. So so far I succeeded without a macro rail. Hmm. But it's it's so suggest I'm I'm gonna be the guy who uh, <laughs> who uh, who takes down the 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 gear um the the depth of gear talk down a little bit. So the so a focus rail in general is there so when you're focused at the closest focusing distance of the lens uh, usually you're focused by moving the camera back and forth instead of turning the, um, the, the focus ring 
And if you have a rail, then you can very precisely uh, just move the camera right. uh, backwards and forwards with a screw. That's that's what they're for, just in case mm -hmm. uh, the viewers yeah. don't yeah, know automatically what that is. Through. And, and some all goes in one direct go in one direction, but others are actually doing both directions. So that's why I thought that those right. those guys. I have one. I don't have it here to show, but um, you can move in all directions. And I think for your case, uh, that also could be very useful to to use without having to move the the yeah. tripod. Well, but that does not help you if you are not perpendicular. It, you don't fix it by having this cross rail. Mm, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. It, so yeah, because you have to move more like that. Try for turning it a bit is is the only way to do it. Yeah, fortunately. Um, so the problem is even bigger if you shoot like butterflies because if you have a motive like this, you basically have three points that you want to have in your very thin layer of sharpness: it's the body and the two tips of the wing. Yeah. So this is next level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this I shot with F2 because I wanted to have this creamy background with all the structure. So this took me a while I bet. at F2 to, to get all things in focus. Yeah, you really don't that want is a beautiful, beautiful shot, though. So that's not a focus stack, then? No, this is not a focus stack. This is... Just how I took it. Full frame, no cropping, F2, yeah. in the well, early morning. It's a good thing that butterflies are such two-dimensional animals. <laughs> <laughs> That's just how they hold their wings. Right. Yeah. Nice. Thing of nice. We're going to talk thing. about focus stacking in a later episode, though. Uh, I've been getting into that uh, a bit more lately. and. Um, so there are lots of things you can you can do to cheat when when you have when you have to use a really thin depth of field, right? Okay, uh, I just realized we're running a little a little yeah, late, uh, think, long on this. Um, I think that's but that's basically it. And then I take the shot, of course, either with a remote control or a timer, so you don't want to shake your camera, and that's it. Out of curiosity, yeah. how much weight do you carry with you when you go out? Well, since I use micro four thirds, it's much less than other people carry, except right. that my tripod is so big. But that's from my DSLR time back then. Um, I don't know. I never weighted it. It's it's okay to carry. I don't yeah. stuff. So, so you you use the uh, Olympus EM5 uh, for for pretty much everything that you shoot. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we've we've uh, mentioned it earlier. Like so, so now they've come out with the successor, with the M5 Mark II. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so, are you interested at all in upgrading to uh, to that? Or it, 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 yeah, I guess <laughs> there are some advantages to it. Obviously, it's a successor, and I think it looks super nice. But uh, um, yeah, is it enough for you to to upgrade to it? Yeah, as as we introduced ourselves in the first episode, we all suffer from gas, which is gear acquisition syndrome. So yes, yeah, of, of course we always want to buy the newest and latest camera for sure. I don't know um, what you were talking about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You are the one I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, for me, I think I will not upgrade. Because it's above thousand dollar, I guess. Um, the improvements are nice, but not big enough for me to switch camera. The EM5 Mark II has a um, a swivel screen, so you can rotate it in all direction. Whereas the version one only has a screen like that, tilt screen. Yeah, yeah. And because I often shoot portrait format, this is not very useful for me then. Yeah, so that, that's, that's, a nice thing. that's something I'm running into a lot. So I have the uh, Panasonic GX7, which has a swivel, no, like a tilt screen like the EM5 that you have. Yeah. Um, but I'm also using the, the GH4, which has that swivel screen, and I absolutely love it. I'm never going to buy a camera again that doesn't have that. And um, yeah, so I think that is a huge upgrade. Yeah. But maybe so not worth that, it. That, that, that is really 
a big thing for me. And then they introduced a high resolution shot where they shift the sensor a tiny bit and then they assemble one picture out of eight shots which are slightly shifted like one pixel and that generates in raw format like a 64 megapixel image. Um, yeah. But of course for doing that your your object does uh, need to be really still, no movement at all. So I'm not yeah. sure if that is useful for, for nature macro photography at all. But for tabletop yeah. it would be I mean if you good. have if you have an ex if you use exposure of half a second, then uh, it seems like yeah, well you you could try that. If I don't know how long it takes to take those eight pictures, but I th I thought from descriptions I read was that it's under a second. So well, uh, if you have exposure of half a second, it's obviously not under a second, right? Well, yeah, I mean you can't. Times, yeah, if it, if it does, you you <laughs> couldn't have that exposure. That's that's obviously true. But if you uh, if you do something like your butterfly shot where you have um, in like a really wide open aperture, then maybe you could do that. That, that might have uh, have worked. Yeah. So that would be something worth trying. Um, but I will not buy the camera just for trying it. Probably. Right. Um, so Olympus, if you want to give me a camera to test that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wink, that wink. Would be nice. that. Uh, yes. Um, I don't know what what else does this camera have. Oh, it 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 is um, said that it has a super great five axis image stabilizer. So the the EM five oh. Mark One has a very nice stabilizer. I love it. Um, when I do handheld photography, which is quite rare in my case, but. Um, well, all the reviews point to the fact that there was a huge upgrade as well to this stabilizer. Yeah, uh, yeah. Large, well, the, larger the... viewfinder too, right? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean the the stabilizer. I think the the biggest uh, uh, improvement in that is that, in combination with the better video modes that they have now, apparently, like that was always the uh, the the ding against the EM5 is that video was such an afterthought in it. Uh, and uh, having a stabilizer is, of course, like really valuable in in video, because uh, it's so hard to get rid of a camera shake while you're filming something if you don't have like a real uh, if you don't have it set on a tripod or something like that. And uh, the the Mark II now has an improved uh, five-axis stabilizer and has better video modes that record at a higher bit rate. So that actually starts becoming like really like you have to be a very Professionally minded videographer to um, to go for let's say the the Panasonic GF GH4 that I'm using right now, which doesn't have stabilization at all, um, but has like more um, like like higher quality video. But if you don't need like the nth degree of control over your video, then it's kind of a, the EM5 is kind of a no-brainer in that regard. It's amazing like how it looks or... like looks like carrying a steady cam around. So you mean the um, new one? I do mean the new one. The the one that CERN has, the the M5 Mark One, is also pretty good at that. But the unfortunately the the bit rate of the video it records is uh, doesn't hold up uh, in comparison with with a camera that's more uh, um, um, but uh, designed with video in mind. So you would think that uh, the new um, the new one is actually a good one for the video right now, and you would be it, for the price. Yeah, well, it it depends on what you're doing. So I think the the new AM5 is if you're mainly a photographer, and uh, you you want to do video too, but you don't really, you're not a professional video, videographer, and yeah. you don't want to invest in additional gear that uh, like like a um, like a some sort of stabilizing rig or something yeah. like that. Uh, then I would totally go for the AM5, something more. Video specialized, like the GH4, I would go for that if I really need a lot of control over my video. Like I use it mm -hmm. in my work where I need to like shoot a lot of macro video, where I really want to have control over everything and where I'm almost never shooting anything handheld, anyways. So, in in that case, that's that's the advantage. But it, and you record at 4K, don't you? Also, right? Yeah, and that's the whole other thing that. Uh, 
many new uh, video cameras or micro four thirds or I think the Sony A7S, uh, yeah, S is, I think it is also records 4K. So if you want that, uh, the the EM5 Mark II doesn't have 4K recording. Mm. Uh, None of them record in RAW, right? For video. No, that's like that's kind of a hacking thing. The the whole raw video recording. That's not really a ca- uh, I think I think that's something okay. that you can hack into your uh, in your into your yeah, Canon yeah. to do that, and um, and something for the really high end uh, like production level video cameras that cost like tens of thousands of dollars. But yeah. you don't usually most most people who professionally work with video don't really use a like a raw like in air quotes workflow with that. Anyway, I think the new EM5 is a really nice camera. Um, if I would not have the first version, I would go for it, I guess. Um, it's it's a really good package. There's not really much to complain about. They fixed all the minor issues of the first version, like buttons are better and the viewfinder is better, although oh, that's I, good to hear. it'll be fine. Yeah, I, the, the I never, I never liked the the handling of the EM5. Yeah, it, but it's you have quite fiddly. Yeah, it's I, I don't know maybe my hands are too big, but uh, I always thought the buttons are like kind of small and squishy, and the camera itself just feels just just a tad too small to be comfortable for me. Yeah, but I agree. Yeah, they they added the focus button. speaking too to the camera. The first oh, yeah. EM5 didn't have focus speaking, which oh. seemed ridiculous. Oh, I didn't. This one now has. Okay, I didn't know that. I thought the EM5 had focus speaking, no. which is, of course, super useful for for macro. I don't know if I I never tried it. I don't know if it is more useful than just using the magnify view. It's pretty useful, even in you macro. You have to buy view. the new okay. one to try it out. <laughs> yeah, you gotta well, get it. The I, gas I, would be, I, again. I, I would be so curious to find out if if the focus shifting would work for your type of photography. I mean, it's very likely that it won't, but I would be so curious because the output that you would get would be so much better. I mean, for sure, you could do amazing pictures of museum collections, for example, right, because they're not moving at all, and those pictures yeah. would just be amazing. Yeah, for Can you actually uh, explain what is focus sorry. speaking? Oh, uh, so focus peaking is a is a feature that um, that that's been around like for for a few years in some cameras, which basically just means that in a camera live view, so where you see uh, the recorded image on the on the back screen, you'll see like there'll be shimmering pixels uh, where your focal plane is. So whatever is in focus will have like a highlight around the edges. So you'll you kind of see where your focal plane is as you focus through. So you you get like this blue shimmer on, uh, on whatever is in focus. Right. I mean, this is something that's been out for a while, um, but it's only been out for a while on mirrorless cameras. Cameras, right? You don't get this on a DSLR. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, exactly. Mm. Okay. Uh, All right. We I should th- close it out. Yeah. yeah. Oh, just the, the the only thing I uh, haven't gotten in somewhere is that um, this uh, this whatever they call it the hyper pixel mode on the on the Mark II uh, where it takes like a f- what is it 56 megapixel photo or something uh, by sensor shifting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know I if it's 56. It's, it's, I think it's 64 in RAW, okay. which is not um, yet fully supported by the softwares, but it will come. Yes, yeah. 46 I in JPEG. Okay. Uh, anyway, so it's, a lot of, it's a lot of pixels. So what I want to say, what I meant to say is like because we're all biologists, but I'm I'm the the one who actually works on on vision uh, and uh, on like basically how sense sensory well, uh, something uh, happened to your life. camera cameras in in the end. So how different eyes work in the in the animal kingdom and uh, this concept of shifting a sensor to get a higher resolution. Resolution image is actually something that is uh, a relatively hot topic in vision science right now because a bunch of animals actually do that to increase their resolution uh, or to increase their uh, motion detection capabilities. I actually have a paper on that in Jumping Spiders. You want to check it out? 